Hi, this is Jenny with Medical Software. Thank you for joining me. Now that we have reviewed system navigation, let's talk about patient demographics. We'll discuss ways to access patient demographics, how to search, the difference between primary and sub-accounts, or family billing, the different tabs in the demographic screen, the different action icons available from the demographic screen, as well as some picture icons or shortcuts available, and we'll describe each tab in detail. Let's get started. There are several ways you can access the patient demographic section of MicroMD. Starting at the bottom left corner of your screen, you'll likely have a shortcut icon for patient. This is going to open the patient demographic search screen. Additionally, you can go to the Maintenance drop-down at the top of your screen and select Patient. And finally, F5 is a shortcut key that can be used to access patient demographics. I'm going to go ahead and just click here to open our demographic search screen. Notice in our action pane over to the left that we're now on the Patient menu. We're on the Patient menu for the search screen, and that consists of the word New first, prior, next, last, user fields, temporary patient list, display order, printing patient information. The new icon allows you to create a new account. First, prior, next, and last, you'll see throughout the system, just allow you to tab through results you may have. They don't really pertain in this screen. User field labels is more of an advanced and administrative function, so we won't be reviewing that, but just allows you to do some configuration on that portion of the system. Temporary patient list is important for those practices that are going to use temporary patients. Temporary patients can be used when scheduling new patients where your system is not generating an account number until the patient actually presents to the practice for treatment. If you intend to use the temporary patient list, then you'll want to view our video that includes temporary patient lists. It's going to be an advanced training. We won't go into much detail on that here today. Display order. I'll go ahead and click on that and you'll notice that it opens a window available for selection and selections made. Now, this type of window you will see throughout MicroMD for configuring your user desktop. Any changes made only affect the user logged in. So if I didn't like the account number displaying first and then name and chart number, and I actually wanted the name and date of birth to be together, I could simply drag and drop those to the positions I want by left click hold and moving them. Additionally, I may want a phone number handy uh, just after the date of birth. Once I hit accept, you'll notice that the order changes. Print patient information doesn't really pertain to this particular window. It's just a button that's carried over from another screen. And finally, we're familiar with the exit window, which simply closes us completely out of our demographic. So let's move on to how do we search, and we'll talk about accounts and sub-accounts. Searching is easy. Uh, you can choose your based on criteria, and the default is going to be by patient name or number. That means by patient name, last name, comma, first name, or by patient number, which is the patient's account number. I can also do a partial name search, like SMI for Smith and AN for Anthony. When I hit my Enter key, it's the same as clicking on my search button. So based on this search, notice I have two different results. I have my patient account on the left side, which is a primary point zero account. And your primary or responsible party accounts will always be the point zeros. And then I also have a sub account section over to the right. I can move this bar as desired to make this window larger. And remember from yesterday or our navigation course, you can resize your windows however you would like. By clicking on Charlotte Smith, not double clicking, just a single click, Notice that sub-account becomes bold or active. This is what happens when I click on the two different sides, account and sub-account. The only reason you would want to do a single click and activate the sub-account side is because you wanted to add a new dependent to Anthony Smith. And so if I were just to click on new now, it's going to open a blank demographic screen, but it's going to pre-format the account with a 1001.x. As I complete the data entry, 
and save, I would now have my point to account. I'm going to go ahead and cancel and continue. If I want to access Anthony Smith, I simply double click on his name. If I wanted to access Charlotte, I would double click on Charlotte's name. Let's go ahead and double click Anthony Smith and open up into his demographics. When we go into a demographic record, you'll notice the patient detail title bar is going to have your patient account number, your patient name, and it'll indicate if a responsible party exists. In this case, it's indicating there is one. If this label is absent, there is no responsible party set. And to see the responsible party information, just click the link over on the left in the action pane, and you'll be able to see who that is. You can also delete or change and save those changes. Responsible party also indicates who will receive any billing statements for a patient account. Once you set up a responsible party, that's where billing statements are sent and generated for. I won't bore you with the details. You can clearly see that you have different fields that you populate information. Some of these may be required fields. That's going to depend on your practice manager and what configuration settings they decide to put in place. Now, one thing I do want to point out is notice that you have areas where the text is in red. Those areas just indicate those are search fields. So when I put a zip code here, it's going to change the city and state automatically. Additionally, when I'm in the referring doctor field, I can type in a doctor's name and hit enter and it's going to bring up anything close or I can type in a doctor's number like number seven and that'll automatically put number seven in there. So these fields are lookup fields. You can double click to get into them. You don't necessarily have to start a search here. You can put a percent sign as a wildcard search etc. If you already know the numbers and so forth, it's going to make it easier for you to populate this information. You also have drop-down lists that allow you to pick from available selections on the system. One field I do want to point out is the remarks field. This field carries over from demographics into appointment screens and billing screens. So if there's information on a patient that needs to be communicated to all three different areas of the system, remarks is a great place to do that. For example, you may want to put must pay balance prior to checking in for appointment. That way, when someone goes to create an appointment for them, they're able to see those remarks and remind the patient during the time the appointment is made, as well as the check-in desk being able to see that when the patient checks in. You also have the ability to indicate a single confidential communication desire for a patient. The billing section is going to be dependent on how your system is configured. Additionally, you have the ability to override or create personal messages that will go out on a patient's next statement just for this patient and one time. Once the message goes out, the system resets it to blank. You also have the ability to force a statement. And we'll go over these settings in the statement training portion. You also have the ability to set up payment arrangements and have the statements go out indicating that the next payment of $25 is due on November 15th or whatever the agreement is with the patient. That will automatically tell the patient you have a total balance of this, but it'll indicate to the patient your payments are going to be due, let's just say, on the 20th of the month and we've agreed to accept $50 a month payments. So now when a statement's generated, it would say, your balance is $986.10. Please pay $50 by 11.20. This portion has to do with the collection setup, and that's something that we will also visit in a later training. Additional fields allow you to track and, and capture race, ethnicity, and so forth. Some of these fields are helpful for sites using EMR and can be generated over an HL7 interface to an EMR. User fields are completely blank and custom fields that can be set up for any purpose, any information that your practice needs to track. The one thing I will point out is this, these top five are called user fields, but then you also have search arguments. User fields will allow you to type in anything you want, numeric code, text, or a combination of. It can be anything at all. Where your search arguments are pre-populated lists that only give you a certain number of items that you can select from. And finally, the last visit section. That just goes over details from the last visit from that patient, last visit date, patient payment, insurance payment, and last ICD-9s. Moving on to the next tab, plan sets. 
This is where the system stores insurance information that has been captured for the patient. Under medical, you have a series of plans. We have a primary, which we know is active because it's a capital letter and it's in bold. We also have a second primary insurance. And notice it's a lowercase and it is not bold. That's just indicating that this has been expired out. So the two field is not blank on that plan. It's going to be populated and it's been termed. You have secondary insurance. And the configuration on secondary is set up a little different. And we'll review that in just a moment. And you can have as many tertiaries as you want to. The next thing, and notice while I'm clicked on medical, notice this yellow default plan set. What that's telling you is whenever you start, it, whenever you add a claim to the system and you start billing a charge, the system will automatically associate this medical plan set to that charge which means that Medicare is going to be the insurance that would receive the claim. You can override the system and say, I don't want it to go to Medicare because it's a work comp issue. And you could change the plan set and we'll see that in more detail when we start to do our charge entry. But you would be able to change it and notice there's no yellow label here to a different primary insurance because it's a work comp issue and not a Medicare claim. And the same would go if you were billing a lab insurance. You'd have the ability to go ahead and associate or choose your lab insurance. And we'll see that again. Let me go into a little detail on the actual plans themselves. And then I'll show you how these are set up and how you edit these. So under our Medicare, we can see our plan ID, which is a number. I can click in there at any point and change this number if desired. I can also search, just like other fields, by typing a partial name and hitting my enter key. And it will bring up the different available choices. So throughout MicroMD, and I won't touch on this too much anymore, but I can put a percent sign for a wildcard search, or I can put a number if I know the plan number, or I can start typing in an insurance name, either full or partial, and hit my enter key, and that will bring up selections that I can choose from. Once you're in a search window and you find the option you want, you can either double click it or highlight by clicking on it one time and then hitting the green check mark. I would continue to add the different information information. One thing I want to point out is when the policy number is the patient's social security number, all you have to do is put SS in the system and hit tab and it'll bring over their social from their detail or demographic screen, provided you've entered the social. Then you would just add the alphanumeric code at the end. You could type in a group number if that applies. You definitely want to be typing in your copays. Now you also have coinsurance that you can store here as well. Your effective date when the policy went into effect. And then the two date. If the policy expired, you want to go ahead and take care of that and make sure there's an expiration date so that you're not sending a claim at a time when a claim would not be process because the insurance was not in effect. From assigned benefits all the way down, this information pulls from the plan setup. So when we configured plan 1317 Medicare, we told it to assign benefits and we made all these settings. You can override those by checking, unchecking, or hitting the drop downs and making the appropriate selection for that patient if you need to override on a individual patient basis. And finally, the policy holder information, relation self. If the relation is self, you'll notice that it just refers to the patient's account number. And that's just telling the system, go back to detail here because all the information you need is going to be there. If the patient were not self, you would choose it from the drop down. And then you would either wipe out the policy number because the patient is, I'm sorry, because the insured is not a patient at your office. Or if the insured is a patient, just simply type in that insured's account number and it'll automatically just reference that patient account or date of birth, address, etc. The next thing is with Medicare selected here, notice I have these two icons. The first one, insurance card card scanning. You have the ability to store images of the cards and print those images. You do need twin compliant scanners in order to do this. There's no add-on cost or licensing other than having a twin compliant scanner that will work with the MicroMD product and we can provide a list of recommended products. Now your eligibility icon, this does require that you have a subscription. Depending on the clearinghouse you're using, you may or may not be able to use this feature. This is something that unless you're working with Practice Insight, we would need to determine on a case-by-case -case basis. 
We're certainly open to exploring and making this option available, if at all possible, to all of our customers. To run an eligibility check, you would simply click the eligibility button up at the top right corner. This is just running an individual. We also have the ability, and we'll learn that through the appointment schedule, to run the entire appointment schedule at one time. The check on an individual patient can take anywhere from 5 to 30 seconds or even up to a minute depending on the carrier time. Once it's finished, you just click OK and it updates this information here and indicates the date it was run. Notice here it's saying that the patient doesn't have coverage and here it's indicating that there's active coverage. Of course, this is a demo system so it's not completely accurate but I always like to show the difference so you can clearly see that you're going to know whether or not that patient has coverage. If you have an interest in the eligibility checks, please let us know and we'll be glad to explore that option. How do we maintain these plan sets once they're created? One thing is we pointed out that this was an expired insurance. You can, you can delete an insurance once you feel like you're never going to go back to it. The reason you would want to leave it is you may have a claim because it was only termed in May that comes back several months after the fact and you need to re <clears throat> look at things or reassess and refile with the carrier. With the information on the system, MicroMD is automatically going to know when a plan was in effect and when a claim should have been billed to that. So if I were to go back and address a claim from March of 2012 in my medical plan set, it's automatically going to know that claim should be addressed to professional risk management and not Medicare based on the date set. Right-clicking on the title bar of a particular plan set allows you to remove that plan set, which would delete all the insurances. Not a good idea. But I can add a new plan to the medical plan set if I needed to. Maybe this Aetna is termed out, and so I would come here and click on Aetna and term it out as of, let's just do uh, the first, and hit Save. And I'm just not going to update that. No, I don't want to delete the insurance card. And then I can right click and say, now let me add a new plan. I want to add a new tertiary plan and it's going to be a Cigna. Let's just type in SIG and see what we get. We're going to use this Cigna Healthcare here. There's my number. There's no group number. There's a $10 copay. It's effective from 1102-2012. The reason I didn't make it 1101 is I just expired out the other one. And that's it. It's my own plan. I'm going to leave it at self and I'm going to hit save. So now I've created a new tertiary plan. So it's saying you have a dependent account. Does this insurance also cover this dependent? If it does, click update. If it doesn't, click cancel. And I'll go ahead and click cancel. Okay, so I've updated this patient's plan set. And if I were to come out of this account and back in, you'll notice that Cigna becomes bold and this one is no longer bold. And let me go ahead and just uh, exit out of Anthony Smith and go back in and show you that. And the reason you have to exit out is the database needs an opportunity to completely refresh. And so there you have it. The Aetna is no longer an active plan, so it's a lowercase non-bold T. But our Cigna is now our active bold plan. That's how you would add one. If I wanted to get rid of this Aetna here altogether because maybe it was a mistake and it never should have been entered and I just don't want any confusion, I can hit delete. I've highlighted on it. Now notice when I click here, look at my name change. And when I click there, look at my name change. So I know I'm on the one I want to delete. And so I'm going to hit my delete icon. I'm going to say yes. And it takes it out of the plan set. Bear in mind when you're deleting insurance plans that you want to make sure that you're never going to have to go back on that plan before you actually delete. Because if you do delete, it's not a terrible problem. It's just time consuming. You're going to have to re-enter that plan if you ever needed to build to it. So a good reason would be, oh, I never should have entered that. That was not insurance for Anthony Smith ever. And we never should build a claim. That would be a good reason to get rid of it. Or it may be a five-year-old plan that I'm never going to be able to go back on. And that would be a good reason to get rid of it. So what are our other options? I can actually come in and let's say that this lab insurance plan, I never should have had that in there. We don't bill insurance or we don't bill for labs and we don't bill the lab insurance. So let me just remove it completely. Right click, tell it to remove plan set and hit yes. It's gone. If I wanted to add a new plan set because maybe I did want to keep in track lab insurance, I can type in lab insurance, hit tab, 
any description here that makes sense to me and then I would come down and choose my plan let's see if there's one that, okay so that wasn't one but we'll just choose that and I can indicate whether it's a primary tertiary etc and just go through the process of putting in my information and that's it uh, once I'm complete and I've gone through everything I can hit save it's a good idea when you're adding and removing plans when you Say you have a, a secondary expiring or a primary expiring and a new one being implemented, expire out the one that exists and hit save and then right click and add new plan to medical set and then save. So each time you do it, if there's a mistake, you're going to know where that mistake was on the plan you turned, on the plan you entered, etc. Um, very good idea to hit save in between each change. Something else I want to point out. When you have a secondary and it is a Medicare secondary and you check that box, it will allow you to set that MSP type code, which is required on all claims. This is a lot of times it's a 47 code and that's where you get those uh, insurance type code not set denials at the clearinghouse for your Medicare secondaries. This is going to automatically do that for you. So when you process your primary claims and then you have a bunch of Medicare secondaries, you don't have to worry about doing anything to those claims. You simply send them out the door to your clearinghouse and they are configured the way they need to be configured as far as the type code is concerned. So that's a good thing. Okay, so I think that that pretty much concludes and, and gives you an idea of how the plan set tab works. Now I will say this is probably the most confusing and the most difficult section of the software to learn. So if you've captured that, you've done a fantastic job. If not, we'll certainly work until it makes sense. Um, it just takes a little getting used to because there's so much automated functionality built into entering these plan sets. Moving on to the cases tab. Cases allows you to store information for medical cases or ailments or illnesses depending on the system you're coming off of. This allows you to create a case description associate a particular insurance plan like your medical, work comp, etc. Indicate chronic or associated diagnosis codes as well as document accident date information, hospitalization, and so forth. All of this information allows you to quickly create claims for these particular ongoing case situations for patients. You can have multiple cases and they can be labeled however is most convenient for you. And the system, if you'll notice, gives you the ability to set one as a default case, which would mean that that case would be the one that would pull into your charge screen when you start to bill a charge by default. And then you would use a drop down to change it. And we'll see more of that in the charge entry training. Again, look over to the left and you'll see your options available and new would just indicate you're creating a new case and you would type in a name. Say it's work comp 2 and it's a neck injury. I could make it my default case or associate it with an insurance plan and so forth. I can give it a chronic diagnosis code and continue on any authorization numbers, etc. Injury date and so on. One other thing you have the ability to do is create a third party for that case. Um, this is used for things like um, nursing home billing it could be utilized for or corporate billing say for drug screens etc. So that is an option as well where you're able to create a case and then when the charge is created rather than billing to the patient it can bill off to a third party uh, at, in a corporate style statement. The next tab is the notes tab. Again, our options are going to change somewhat. And notes just allows the system to document things that are happening on that patient account, like a statement was created, etc. And the user to document contacts with patients. To create a new one, simply click the new icon over to the left and it's going to open up a new one. It's automatically going to tag the note with whatever user is logged into the system. And then you would just type the note here and save. All right, my Windows 7. So you would type the note here and save or you also have the ability to create a to-do or reminder for yourself or another user in the practice. And this is something the to-dos uh, when I check that box and I hit save it's automatically going to pop up my task management system allowing me to see the note that was typed and I can either create a reminder and tell the system the date and time or I can assign a task 
and I can do both assign it to another user on the system so this would create a task for that user if your practice decides to use the task management system we'll go into more detail on that and finally you have the contacts tab and this allows you to store emergency contact next of kin information etc for your patients you can create as many as you like going back to the detail tab i want to go through some of the options your microMD dms chart are for the practices utilizing the emr system Patient chart note just simply opens up an editor screen like a word pad populating the majority of the patient's information allowing you to type a quick note here and print that off as desired. Not really a popular feature anymore um, with EMRs but it's still available. Plan visits allows you to document based on a particular procedure and or diagnosis or both and allows you to indicate how many visits are approved. The system will automatically count down how many remaining visits there are and associate the authorization. Appointment history. We'll go into more detail on this, but your appointment history, both current appointments, the log, which are past appointments, and both can be searched and pulled up in the system. You can set date ranges for certain periods, etc. It's going to show you canceled, rescheduled, etc. The patient log. This is going to track modifications to insurance, demographics, etc. So when there are changes made to the account, the system is going to notate that in this log and you'll be able to see what user actually made the change to the patient account. Labels and mail merge allows you to create a mailing label for the patient as well as uh, print other mail merge documents. And that's something we'll train on in an advanced training class. Responsible party just allows you to view or set responsible party for that particular patient. The billing inquiry takes you into the billing screen for the patient, allowing you to see basically your patient ledger information. I can tell it to show only non-zero accounts and I can do it based on account or based on patient, ascending or descending. Remember the remarks field I told you shows throughout the system and here I'm able to see the remarks and I'll go into this in more detail during our billing training. Delete. This allows you to delete the patient account. This is a security area that most practice administrators limit. But be careful because once you delete a patient account, you cannot recover the history for that patient account. The system will not allow me to delete a patient that has a balance. I should have gotten a pop-up, but in my demo system it didn't. should say I can't delete a non-zero account. However, if it is a zeroed out account and you have delete rights, you will be able to delete that account. It will give you one opportunity not to do so. And once you say yes, go ahead and delete it, it the system will delete the account. Finally, print patient information. This allows you to print the demographic information, making registration or check-in a little bit more convenient for your patients because you can simply print this registration page and ask the patient to handwrite any changes, uh, maybe cross out and then handwrite other changes. And let me um, change my printer here. And let's set this as my default. So print patient information allows you to print patient demographic screen so that you can hand it to your patients. We'll call it patient demographic and we'll dump it to our desktop. And let me go grab that document. And this is what this would look like for your patients. So the patient would be able to see their name, address, and so forth, their insurance information on file, as well as you have the ability to put a financial responsibility statement in. This is the default one, but it can be changed. So your patients can look at this, read your authorization, consent for treatment, whatever you want to add in here. I've received my HIPAA, consent for treatment, and the fact that I'm financially responsible and sign off, and I'll show you where to change that later in the system in an administrative course. But these can be utilized to quickly register and update your uh, existing patients. So those are the icons that are available under the patient menu. As I move to some of the different ones, you'll notice that those are going to change different tabs. And that's okay. It's just making certain things available or not available. Finally, in the top right corner, you'll see some picture icons. And these are a really a repeat of the icons you're seeing here for the most part. With the exception of we have the ability to capture the patient picture or scan the driver's license by clicking on this icon here. And just as we did on the insurance, click the scan icon and with a Twain compliant scanner, you can capture the insurance information.
You can track referrals into your system or going out of your system. There's two different versions, a simple version, which is what you're seeing, and then a more detailed version that would bring a, a note screen allowing you to indicate uh, the date they were referred, what special day, uh, and who they were referred to as far as what doctor based on what diagnosis, or if they're referred from somebody and what the diagnoses are. Um, reason, authorization number, next contact, um, notify a particular user on the system, etc. And that would create a reminder, a general note, uh, when the appointment is made and what the date is, how many visits are allowed, etc. You can also hit the notes button up top and type notes as you have contact. So you're able to track every step in the referral process. Additionally, you have the ability to create documents and or labels so that you can print a letter or a label, etc. based on uh, your referral. Once you've documented stuff you hit accept, it populates it into the listing here. And so if I were to go into this one, I can see that it was referred on 10-9, referred to this doctor, referenced this diagnosis, and the referring doctor is our, our doctor in-house, doctor primary. Um, hypertension is the reason, the authorization number, the start date, um, etc. If for some reason I needed to add a note, maybe the practice calls and says the patient did not show up for the appointment, I can come in here and say, you know, uh, referring doctor called and said patient did not show up for appointment. This way I have a record of that in my system as well. You could also print that off and put it in the patient's chart or share it with the doctor. So that's a really nice module. The other thing we have is a recall module and this allows us to set up recalls. They can be automatic or um, they can be manual and so based on certain diagnosis codes you can set up automatic re uh, recalls that are set or prompted when you start billing out a charge it will prompt the, the biller to set up a recall. This will be addressed in a more in, or one of our advanced courses and if it's something that you're going to be utilizing, we can certainly go into some detail and training with that. The prescription add-on to MicroMD, I don't believe this is available any longer, but I would need to check for if you were interested in prescriptions through the practice management side based on the fact that the EMR has integrated it with the EMR side. That may not be an available feature. The DMS chart, that's just out allowing you access to the document management portion of the EMR if you're an EMR client. You can have lab interfaces push in lab results to your patient accounts. HIPAA, this is a, a nice little tool and there will be some training on that, but let me just quickly show you that you can have different messages indicating we need a new insurance card and so forth. Uh, and it's a way to communicate to a patient. I'll show you that in just a moment. And you can track code history and uh, ICD-9 history um, based on certain setup in the system if you have the need to, to track and count how many times a patient has been seen on a particular thing. And case notes just allows you to insert and have notes on particular services. Um, this again has been replaced with the EMR, but the tool is still built into the practice management side. So let me, um, based on that, really from this menu, the icons you will use are the patient picture, the two books, referral and recall. And then the other thing is this gold key. It's the HIPAA key, but I call it the key to information. It's a great communication tool. And let me show you what I mean. Let's go into Charlotte Smith. Charlotte Smith has a couple of these communication tools set up. So as I access Charlotte Smith's account, before I can do anything, you can see that window blinking at me. I can't do any kind of go into the log or anything because I've got this HIPAA message that's popped up. And there are two different message types. The yellow message types are system generated. That means that the system has a setting, some administrator or somebody on the system has set up and tag every single patient account with this particular line item, the yellow one. The green one, however, indicates that it was only set for this patient, so it is specific to the patient. So while in the January 1, I need a new privacy practices signature on file for everybody, indicating that they were given the HIPAA information, check for new insurance card won't pertain to everybody necessarily. And so I can open that 
and I can see additional information. Check for new insurance. It's saying yes. It was set on 11.6 saying by this user and it, it's, it says everything I need to know. I need to check for new insurance because probably there was a claim that was filed recently that was rejected or said the insurance was no good. As far as the privacy, the notice of privacy practices, that was set and I can simply check it and say accept on it to say I've already taken care of that. And so I've left the one tag on there because it's not, it, maybe it's not been satisfied. I may have just been accessing the account for reasons uh, other than the patient being in the clinic. But the privacy practice, I say, oh, well, I just looked at a chart and they signed it on whatever day. So it's been within the last couple of months. So we don't need that tag. And I can remove it by doing exactly what I did. Check the box and hit accept saying that that's been taken care of. But I still need to check. We still need someone when this patient shows up for treatment at the next appointment to check for a new insurance card. And that's going to show no matter where I go. So I can hit close and continue working in the patient account as I need to. I can even put here in the remarks field, check for new insurance, because remember, this is going to show no matter where I go in the system, check for new insurance. So if I were to come into their billing screen or their ledger, I can see check for new insurance. I'm also going to see that pop up that I have to either open or close. So I can't say that I was not made aware. I'll quickly take us into a billing screen and show you the same thing on that patient. I see two things. I see my pop up and I have my check for new insurance. And finally, if I were to go to a schedule, and I know this is all looking like a whole lot of information for you, but I also get notified here to check for new insurance and my remarks field pulls over. So every place I go in the system is documenting that remark is going to carry over. So it's a good idea and a good way to communicate. So to recap on the patient demographic screen, we have several ways that we can access this and that is through our quick link icon at the bottom, choosing patient, maintenance and drop down choosing patient, or our shortcut F5 key. When we're inpatient, our menu will change in based on where we are in the demographic screen, those menus will continue to, to change. All features you see may or may not be useful or available in the particular window. Each screen allows you to add the important information to keep a well-documented patient account. Updates are tracked and logged. You have quick link icons and communication tools like the HIPAA key to communication allow you to share information throughout the system with other users. This will conclude the demographic training portion of MicroMD.